my daughter just called me this morning and and with a word that she felt like was for for the church and so I just wanted her to Fire. get a chance Please. to share. Good morning. <laughs> um, yeah, so as I was praying for you guys, the Lord just put Matthew 16 on my heart. Um, as Jesus is asking the disciples, who do you say I am? And they give a couple answers. And then Peter says, um, "You in verse 16, sorry, um, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, blessed are you Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I will tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, and I just felt like the Lord wanted to encourage you guys that God is building this church. That our responsibility as followers of Jesus is to stand before the Lord and let him transform us and let us reveal himself to us. Um, and... God is building the church, not not us. So, Very good. Yeah. Awesome. Good, work. good work. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Now, um, you know, before I get into uh, the message, that I feel like God's put in my heart for you guys. Um, I I just was praying for you too, and I felt like the Lord dropped this uh, on my heart as well. And I'm gonna grab my big giant Bible. <laughs> but it's it's out of uh, Jeremiah chapter 4 and bear with me because it's going to sound like it's a rebuke but it's not um, no no way but it's Jeremiah 4 uh, 31 and this is a time period where Israel has been taken uh, uh, captive they're in bondage uh, to Babylon. And, I mean, Jeremiah goes through all kinds of personal drama and trauma, um, just being the prophet uh, at that time. Uh, and, and in verse 31, it says, I hear a cry like a woman in labor, a cry of anguish like one bearing her first child, the cry of, the, of daughter Zion, gasping for breath, stretching out her hands. And it ends saying, woe is me, for my life is weary because of the murderers. And the Lord spoke that word to me, and I was thoroughly confused <laughs> as to what he was trying to get at. But what I really felt like God was saying is that he, like this cry that Israel was having, uh, is wanting to birth this, this site, this future church plant, uh, in his in his own way and in his own timing and in his uh, in in his power, and uh, you know feeling the 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 birth pains. I've never had the privilege of delivering a baby uh, out of my body, and thank God that will never be the case. Sorry, <laughs> women, but I, my wife has three different times, and. Um, my daughter was the only natural birth. Both my boys were C-sections and, um, I'm standing there in the, in the delivery room and my doctor says, Hey, do you want to, do you want to deliver your baby? And so I was like, sure, why not? So I slapped the gloves on and, and, you know, I'm gully. I'm like, let's, let's, let's go. Like, you know, I don't know what this is going to look like. I've only heard of it, but I like to stay on this side of the, anyways, um, <laughs> So I'm just there, right? And like naturally, my, my wife's body is doing what it's supposed to do. And I'm just there facilitating this baby coming out. And the doctor is standing behind me. And at a certain point, he starts telling me, hurry up. You need to do this. And you need to do that. But you need to hurry up. And I turn to him I'm like, dude, I've never done this before. Like, cut me some slack. You do this every day. Like, but he's, he's, he's instructing me how to do it. And he's instructed me to, to move along. And, uh, what I felt like God was saying is that in these pains of, of sites and plants and future, um, God does it. And it's, it's like what Olivia was saying is that he's building the church. He does it. We're there to facilitate what God is wanting to do by the instructions of the Father. 
And if we can just release ourselves to be free in that, where we don't have to do all of the work, we don't have to do. Now, I understand there's work to be done and we put our hand to the plow, but we do it in a way that is going to be what, instructed by the father. Because this is his baby, right? This is his delivery. This is his church. And, and so uh, just be encouraged to allow the gift of God that's in you to come out. There's no way, like, I mean, none of, none of you ladies in here would uh, let me deliver your baby, right? Yes, thank you for agreeing. <laughs> God calls us to a specific place at a specific time for this specific thing. And, and so he's called you at this time in this place to be a part of what he's doing. And so let, let's grab hold of that and let's, let's trust God for, for our future. Um, so that's, that's for free now. Uh, this one's going to, yeah, it'll cost you. It'll cost you a little or a lot, but it's going to cost you. No. Um, mainly I'm going to be out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If uh, if you wanna if you wanna turn there, we're gonna bounce around a little bit, but you know, um, just I don't know what side of COVID we're on, to be honest. I don't know if we're in the front end, the middle, the back. Who knows? Um, no one knows, <laughs> to be honest. It's the truth, right? But we keep hearing all the time, especially in the life of the church. Um, you know, God's doing something new in the church, and. You know, be, a, be the church. Just don't do the church. And be a part of the new thing God is doing. And, and, and I've heard, you know, a number of people say that. We've had people come into our church and, and tell me that and preach that. And, and at the end of their sermons, I always ask them, okay, well, what does that look like? <laughs> what is that? Like, it, they're, they're, tell me the formula. And the reality is there is no formula. Right? Uh, that's the reason why one church up the street can be 5,000 and the church down the street can be five, right? There is no formula to this. There is no uh, just add water and watch it grow. It, it is trusting and trusting uh, the fact that we know who God is, believe in the fact that he's called us to be a part of what he's doing, and then getting on with it. You know, uh, uh, Zechariah chapter 4, everyone loves to quote Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10. Uh, don't despise humble beginnings. And can I say, like, a lot of people use that in the context of, you know, smaller groups and smaller gatherings. And, and don't despise that because God's going to do something. Can I tell you something? God's already, God's already done it. And, and what Jesus has done on the cross has opened up a, 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 an environment that we can't even see. Yeah. Right? He's opened up the kingdom of God in a way that we could never even fathom in and of ourselves. And what we see maybe in, in small numbers in this building does not equate to what God is doing in the kingdom. Yeah. And, and so if we get so focused on what we see with our eyes, we're going to miss out on what God is actually wanting to do because we'll, we'll hamstring ourselves based on what we see. God doesn't want us to look at what we see. He wants us to look at him, keep our eyes focused on him, be a part of what he's doing. And it doesn't matter how many people you, how many people you see. Yeah. What matters is what God is doing through those people. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, I believe that Jesus is building his church. Yeah. All right, there's two things that I know God is building. He's, he's preparing a place for us in heaven, and he's building his church. Yeah. And I believe that the church Jesus is building is an amalgamation of hurt, honest, confused, passionate derelicts, and devoted disciples, right, that are all mixed into one, one group, one body, right? I love, like, looking around here and, and, and when we, when, you know, just seeing, look, at, look who's here, right? You got black, Native American, Mexican, South African Americans, and... and <laughs> You got Russians and Afghanis and <laughs> But this is the church. And then when we read in Revelation, this is all nations, all people, all tongues that are worshiping God. And this is what this is if this is the kingdom and this is what we see in heaven, this is what we should actually see here in the church. 
And we celebrate our differences, right? We celebrate where we've come from. We celebrate what we've walked through. We celebrate where we're going in God. And we see all those things from a different vantage point, and it's okay. <laughs> it really is. If we're going to get a cardboard cut out of a one person and say, this is the person that we want to reach, then 99% of us have to leave yeah. to go get all the people that look like that, that think like that, that act that way. Truth is, we have to be prepared for whatever condition people walk in this church. Yeah. Right? And, and they, they vary. Right? You have people that have been saved for 20 years that are still struggling with their relationship with God. You have people that have been saved for two weeks that are just uh, flying high yeah. in the spirit and doing some miraculous things. And we, we embrace everybody, not based on our thinking and how we think they should be or how they should act. Well, you've been saved long enough. You should know better. We all have our, our journeys, right? We're all in some way we've been broken or we've been bruised, right? We've been healthy and we've been whole, you know? Uh, I've been married for, it'll be 25 years in, in, in June. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank the Lord my wife hasn't killed me. She said to me the other day, she's like, I don't know whether to kiss you or hit you. And I said, that sounds like 25 years of marriage to me. <laughs> Listen, I'm still learning how to be a good listener. What are you talking about? We have our own journeys in God, just like we have our own journeys in our own lives, right? But we're one body. And this is, this is the church that God is building. This is the per church Jesus is building. And it's centered around him as the head of the church and us as his body, one body. Not this divided mess in need of, of plastic surgery, not one body diseased and dysfunctional, but one body that's unified, unlike the world. There's so many things that divide the world. You do, you should tell me what time I need to stop. <laughs> I like Alistair. <laughs> okay. So there's so many things that divide us in the world, right? There's politics, there's marriage, there's race, there's race and ethnicity, right? There's spiritual beliefs, and all those things actually tend to creep into the life of the church, right? I, I, I can get us all in an argument by asking you one question, and you know what the one question is, but I'm not going to say it because I don't want you to start getting mad at me. You wouldn't think that Jesus is a, uni is a unifier in the church sometimes. <laughs> but we're all living under the banner of Jesus. And, and unfortunately, we let the world creep into the church and begin to splinter what the body looks like. And I think those differences tend to seem godly, right, in nature. But, but in fact, they're born out of the flesh. They're born in sin. You know? Social media, news, right? Um, laws that get passed, education, from kindy to college. Yeah. <laughs> the things that are taught and learned yeah. just tend to divide us. And, and listen, there's some good ideas. There's some good thoughts that go out. And the intentions most of the time seem earnest. But, but the truth is, is that they're steeped in jealousy, they're steeped in pride, they're steeped and based in sin. Yeah. When, when we have a good idea that isn't birthed in heaven, that isn't founded off of the word of God, those things will always divide us. And then we'll lose sight of the point of the gospel, which is to seek and save the lost, which is the love of God pouring over people so much so that they can't deny Jesus. Right. The truth is, is, is when when people are confronted with who Jesus is, they do have an option. Right. They have an option to say yes or say no, but they can't ignore what has happened in their lives. And they, but they make a choice and, and, and we make choices right with our personalities and our perspectives. You know, everyone else's perspective is, is wrong, by the way, except for mine. <laughs> right. That's that's kind of how we tend to li live life. 
It's, it's how we tend to have conversations with people and explain things. We explain things the way that we understand it, not for other people to understand. And again, it creeps into church and how we do church. I don't like this leadership style. I don't like, I don't like the band. I don't like kids' church. I don't like... Th- I, I've been leading our church for uh, almost six years. And can I tell you something? There's things that I don't like about our church that I want to change personally, but it's not my church. Yeah. If I want I to put my stamp on it and make it my church, then it would look completely different and it wouldn't have the, the bona fide uh, authorization of the Holy Spirit on it. Yeah. It would be Darian's church. And I don't want that. No one wants that. <laughs> uh, truth is, you know, nothing good lives in me. That's what Paul said in Romans. Nothing good lives in me. And so when we allow the flesh to give birth to our desires... We always end up in trouble. Yeah. A lot of times that happens, and, it, and what it does is it brings division. Yeah. And division is a disease that in the church we've got to eradicate. Yeah. Paul identified this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, starting in verse 10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, not by his name. <laughs> Paul had cloud. He had influence with these people. He, he led them to the Lord. He's planting these churches, but he doesn't come to them and plead with them in the name of Paul. He appeals to them in the name of Jesus. And he asks that all of you agree. Listen. I could ask anybody, I, we, just this four people in this row. Where do you want to eat? When we're not going to agree. We're not going to agree. Right? We could ask anything, style, whatever. Do you like X, Y, Z? We're not going to agree. But Paul is saying, I am, I am appealing to you that you all agree. That seems like a tall order. That seems almost impossible to even ask. But he goes on and says that there be no divisions among you. And that you be unified or united in the same mind and in the same judgment. See, we can we can rally around the same ideas based on what the Bible says. Right. We can we can become unified around the gospel. It may look different to each one of us, but if we can unify behind what the gospel says, how it works out, the outworking in your life, the outworking based on my life or your life, it is going to look different. And that's great. Why? Because Alistair is going to reach people that I'll never reach. Right? You're going you're gonna to minister to people that I'll, I could never minister to and vice versa. Why? Because we're different and that is the way it's designed. I used to work at Robbins Brothers, the world's biggest engagement ring store. To, it's just, yeah, that's what you had to say when people walked in the room. Welcome to Robbins Brothers, the world's biggest engagement ring store. How can I help you? <laughs> I had to become a, a, a diamondologist to, in order to sell, right? And what I learned about diamonds, especially the round diamond, there's so many facets and cuts to that diamond that when the light hits it, it refracts and bounces off of the different cuts And that's why you see all these different uh, rays of light that come out of it. It's different than a princess cut or an emerald cut. If you don't know what I'm saying, don't worry about it. If you don't know what I'm saying, you don't, you don't, you shouldn't be worried about getting married. Put it that way. Right? But, but the different refractions of light that pop out of it is based on the different cuts of it. And, and, And what I started to think about was God and his multifacetedness. Preachers always make up words. Um, (laughs) But the way you reflect God is different than the way I reflect God, than the way that you reflect God, than you. And and that's great. And that's that's uh, that's the important part of the kingdom is that we all represent God in his in his image. I'm never going to finish. All right. Verse 11. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. 
What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I, I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ, or I follow TK, or I follow Chris, or I follow whoever. Is Christ divided? It's impossible for him to be divided. If he's the head of the church and he's divided, then he's a two-headed monster. And anything with two heads is a monster. Don't get it. Don't, don't think anything different. Christ is not divided. Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius. So that none may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize this guy, but beyond that, I love the way Paul has to clarify everything here. But Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom. Can I tell you something? Your post on Instagram, you're trying to be more clever than the gospel. You read those and it's like, oh, man, that's so inspirational. But it has nothing to do with kingdom. It has nothing to do with the Bible. And now I'm leading people to think a certain way because I want to be more clever than the gospel. Paul's like, listen, I didn't come to you with eloquent words. And he could have. He's an educated guy. Pharisee of Pharisees, right? That's what he claims to be. And and a Pharisee had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. I have a hard time reading the Bible through Leviticus, right? And he had to memorize that. (laughs) So if he's a Pharisee of Pharisees, then I'm assuming that he had more memorized and more learned, more learned through Scripture. He says, I didn't come with you to you with eloquent wisdom. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. It's the gospel that unites us. And that's why he can have the audacity to say, I appeal to you. That there be no divisions among you. I appeal to you. That you agree. The one thing that we have to fight for. And and especially early on. Right. And and I want to help lay something into the DNA, the foundations of. Uh, of this site that will eventually be a church plant is that you have to fight to maintain unity. We get unity in Christ, right? We're unified in him, but we have to fight to keep it. That's why we have to fight for our salvation with fear and trembling, right? We walk out our salvation. And so we have to fight for unity. We have to fight to maintain it. It's not easy. You've been married for two months. You know, unity is not easy. Then you throw a kid in the mix. Unity is harder. Jesus knew that. So in his in his last prayer to God with his disciples, he prays in John 17, 11. He says, I am no longer in the world talking to God, but I but they are. Speaking of his disciples, and and I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus knew that that unity in the church would be difficult. So he prayed to God for it. He prayed over his disciples for unity, that they would come together as one. You heard, you've all, most of you have heard this analogy, right? Your five fingers separated aren't as powerful as when they're, when they're together. When you make a fist and those fingers are now combined to make one powerful weapon, right? And sometimes I think we forget that we are in a war, right? We're not fighting each other. And we should stop that, by the way. We shouldn't even engage with, with fighting one another. We've got a bigger enemy yeah. at foot, right? The devil is here to steal Kill and destroy, right? And, and, and sometimes I think, oh, yeah, still killing. No, he's here to murder. You put it in that concept, murder. He's here to take your life. He's here to keep you constantly separated from the presence of God for eternity. And sometimes we forget that we're in this battle, this fight, and we try to do things on our own. We try to, we, well, I don't like the way they do that, so I'm just going to go worship Jesus on, at, at Red Rocks. I'm just going to sit there Indian style or, sorry, um, crisscross applesauce. (laughs) We we can't fail to achieve unity in the body. 
We can't. It's the story of this Christian guy who gets stranded on an island. And he's on there for a while, and he builds two churches, right? And so the rescuer is coming. They're like, why did you build two churches? He's like, well, that's the church I go to, and that's the church I don't go to. <laughs> You'll get that later. <laughs> We're conflicted even in ourselves. There's constant conflict within ourselves, right? Because it's the flesh versus the spirit, right? And then we give way to the flesh, and it's like, yeah, I don't like that church. I don't like those people. I don't like the way they do that. I don't like the way they look. And we're constantly now taking our inner conflict and putting it out there for the whole world to see instead of giving it to God. All right? The, the Spirit of God has over, overcome our fleshly desires, our, our, our desperate nature to want things for ourselves and live for ourselves. The Spirit of God is always coming and saying, what about God? There's more in God. There's power to do what you want to do in God. Your future in God. I think if we're, if we're honest, and I think this, the, and pastors are not exempt from this, right? Because they're people. We all have to deal with our inner conflicts, whether it's rage or depression or anger, or racism, sexism, whatever it is. We always are, are dealing with those things. And, and we shouldn't suppress them. I think if we learned about anything, you suppress things and they just erupt. Instead, we give them over to God. We freely offer him our issues. God, I, I do deal with this. I, I need to give this to you. That's where the love of God comes in. I think... Oh, I got to go. We're fighting for unity. And I think unity, again, happens when we embrace our differences. Yeah. Just think about the disciples for right now, right? You got, you got these fishermen who are hardworking. You want to call them blue collar or whatever, hardworking guys, right? You have Matthew, the tax collector. And everyone bags on Matthew, oh, he's a thief and this. But he had, to, he had to be educated to get that job. He had to have influence with the Romans to be actually appointed to that position, and he, he did steal, but, you know, we'll, we'll get back to that. <laughs> right? You had a zealot in Simon. Yeah. Uh, well, he's an anarchist. He was a terrorist. We try to make it all nice. Oh, he, was, he, was, he had zeal for the Lord. No, no. <laughs> no. He's the reason why we have to take off our shoes at the airport. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, that's, this is who Jesus chose. And then there's a few guys that, that don't even have a job. They're, just, they just get, they're loiterers for all we know, right? They're vagabonds just sitting around. And Jesus pulls all these guys together, and he calls them his disciples. <laughs> People we probably wouldn't choose on our team. And, and if we're honest, as I, as I look in the mirror, I wouldn't choose me for my team either. <laughs> right? I know where I've come from, and I know what I, where I've been, and I'm like, mm, we'll come back to you there's any room left but let's go forward to, to Acts chapter 2 right the, the upper room when, where the disciples are waiting for the Holy Spirit right and, and Jesus tells them to wait you read that and who's up there there's women up there there's women in the upper room there's disciples there's non-disciples I'm going to leave it there. Their differences didn't separate them. Their differences weren't, oh, well, you can only do this. You know, why don't you leave and go take care of the kids? Because they're, I hear them like they're making a lot of noise. Jesus' mom was up there. <laughs> so let's, I mean, think about that. Like, oh, Mary, blessed, blessed, you know, mother of Mary. You know, she's, you know, she's. Jesus' mom. She had a life after birth. She had a life after birth in all those kids, right? She had a life in the kingdom. So gender, race, socioeconomic, all those different demographics that we want to pick and choose from, 
to say this and that about. God is saying, no, 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 we're all unified together. Those aren't obstacles. Those aren't dividers. Those are actually pluses for multiplication. I'm going to just, I, I, I love, Chris knows I love, I love him and I love you guys. Listen, I, I'd help, I was part of the church planning team for Redemption City, right? So long ago. But can I say this? Jesus is not a Republican. He's not a Democrat either. If Green Party was around, he wouldn't be them either, right? He's not Methodist or Orthodox. He's not Catholic. He's not whatever. He's a king of kings. He's not, the black, he's not in the, the black church, the white church, the Vietnamese church, the Spanish-only speaking church. I mean, he is the head of the church, the whole church. And, and the moment we start to isolate people and say, well, if you're not, you're not a Christian if you're not a Republican. Oh, you're a bleeding liberal. You can't come or we only want. What did Jesus do? He picked the most obscure group of people that were from different backgrounds to represent the kingdom, to turn the world upside down, the Bible says. We have to constantly overlook what may divide us. Listen, get this into your heart. Weave this into how you actually view God and the perception that you have of of the church because it's important to move forward in order not to to despise what God is doing because I believe despising those small beginnings is saying not you anyone but you that's how we despise these beginnings that's how we despise what God is actually wanting to do I think unity happens when we choose to handle conflict biblically. Yeah. Now, curl your toes back because I might step on one or two. <laughs> but Matthew 18, 15, right? If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Yeah. If he listens to you, you've gained a brother. Right? And that goes for sisters too. Right? Right? You go to that person, to them. You don't call your best friend. You don't call whoever and start talking about this person. Give them a secondhand offense, and then you work it out. I'm mad at Patrick, and then I go tell Chris about it. And, and Chris is now offended and, and mad at Patrick and has no idea really why he's mad at him. But then I go work it out with Patrick, and Chris is still mad. For what? And then he gets mad at me because why are you hanging out with him? I thought he was the enemy. All the time in church. Can I just being honest, man? I, I, I believe that if we were able to handle biblical conflict, we wouldn't have seen the things that we saw last January. We wouldn't have seen the things that we saw two summers ago because we learned how to handle conflict in a biblical manner. But, you know, Jesus doesn't let us off the hook just with Matthew 18. But before that, in Matthew 5, Verse 23 says, if you are, if you are offering your gift to the, at the altar and, and there you remember that your brother has something against you. Not only am I, uh, am I talking about if I've offended someone, right, or if my brother has offense against me, but now if I know that I've offended someone, oh, they'll get over it. It wasn't that big of a deal. How do you know? You don't know what races through people's minds. You don't know the, the, the past conflicts that they've had that have left scars that we just open up. But if we can go and say, listen, man, you know, I, I said something and I, and I could tell by your face you didn't really care for it. And that's happened in all this morning. But anyways, <laughs> forgive me already. <laughs> but if we can just say, man, I, you know, I didn't I didn't mean to, to do that. This, this is what I meant to say. Right. I, I apologize for that. Then we're bringing healing. We're actually showing the love of God. And that's how we handle conflict. Leave your gift before you, before you give it to God and go to that person and work it out. I just believe that some people just crave controversy. Right? They just want drama because it fuels their life. They want to have 
conflict, constant conflict, and they want to, to quarrel with people. Stay away from those people. Right? We need to learn how to handle conflict, but if you crave conflict, that's a whole different story. Stay away from those people that gossip. Listen, get this into the DNA. Listen, I've worked hard because I felt like this was something God told us in our church. I worked hard to keep this. You know how I work hard at it? Is I don't do it to my wife. I don't gossip about people in the church to my wife because that opens a door for her to gossip and, and for other leaders to begin to gossip. And then if the other leaders are gossiping, then the whole church starts to gossip. And gossip, I believe, is the number one killer to churches. Stay away from those people. Paul says in, in 1 Timothy 6, 4, that those people have an unhealthy craving for controversy. And, and if we're a part of that, we're actually disintegrating the church from the inside out. The moment we begin to say something out of turn that has nothing to do with you or how you feel or what's going on in your life, but you're now depicting someone else's life. We're in trouble. He, he, Paul goes on in Titus chapter three and he says, those are foolish controversies and they're to be corrected. And if, they're, if people are unresponsive, they're, needed, they're, they're to be seen as warped. And self-condemned. Listen, we need to correct that in our own lives. Right? Let's not allow those things to come into our lives and develop those seeds to develop plants that, do, that eventually will show fruit. Yeah. All right, well, I'm just excited. I'm zealous for the Lord. No, actually, you're just zealous to be zealous. Right? I have, I have this feeling of zeal. No, no. You just want to be in the mix of everything, and that's not healthy. Those people who want to arm wrestle about everything, I think this should be blue. Well, you know, blue is not a great color. Like, who cares? Like, seriously, like, we have a team that sets up our, like, a backdrop, and I just show up on Sunday, and I stand in the front, I stand in front of it, and I preach. Like, I could care less if it was a chair. They had a Christmas tree up there during Christmas. They just changed it again while I'm gone for February. I don't know, for Valentine's. I don't know what they're doing. I don't care. I care. You don't get me wrong. I care, but I don't. Like, that is not going to, in one I owe to, like, determine my relationship with God or what I want to get out of the people, out of the relationships with the people in the church. we got to let some of these things go. Controversy is, is, is unhealthy for the church, and it's not the church that Jesus is building. Now, Jesus was controversial, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm landing. You heard that a hundred times before. Yeah. Crash landing. You know, people, I've, we, I've, met, I've worked with people that are like, I'm, I'm going to be offensive because Jesus was offensive. It's like, you're just being offensive for offensive sake, and no one wants to do that. Who wants to be around someone like that? Jesus was controversial, but it was always some, around something that represented the kingdom, not his personal, you know, uh, uh, belief about something. It was about the kingdom of God. I only see, I only do what I see my father in heaven doing. I'm going to mess you up, Slane. Sorry. I, I'm just going to, I'm going to go back to these tax collectors, right? Jesus is walking by, sees Zacchaeus in a tree. Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to your house for dinner. Zacchaeus was a known offender, right? Tax collector. He was known for, for taking more than what he probably should and putting it in his own pocket. So much so that he gets radically saved and says, listen, I'm going to give back everything I stole plus some. Right? Because he encountered who Jesus was. But he would have never encountered who Jesus was if Jesus wouldn't have just been open enough to say, come on down from that tree. Let's go have a meal. That's controversial. But it wasn't for controversy's sake. It was for the soul of Zacchaeus. So in essence, Jesus doubled down with those tax collectors, didn't he? 
So maybe we should just be introspective about what God is calling us to. The church that Jesus is building is one church, united under him. 